Hi guys, let me introduce Mr. Eric Whittaker, the famous American composer, conductor, and uh, he wants to be the fifth member of that Mode. Yeah. <laughs> that should have been so, first. Yeah. <laughs> We arrived to Budapest with a fantastic jet line. <laughs> yeah. First of all, from Los Angeles, and after that, uh, he he gave a Manchester lecture. He conducted his own choir, and the day after, he had a master class. So uh, I think you are very tired now. That's okay. <laughs> so uh, how could you summarize your experiences here in Hungary? Uh, very satisfied with the students of the Liszt Academy and the halls acoustics. Uh, yeah, uh, the students are terrific. Uh, everyone has been so warm. I see, and this is not like people are Very, very thoughtful, very smart. I mean, really high level students. And then the, the List Academy, the building is just, it's stunning. I, I can't imagine what it looked like before the renovation, but now the halls and all of the, all of the classrooms are, they're unparalleled. They're extraordinary. As I heard, uh, you were quite surprised uh, when uh, you realized that your compositions are popular here in Hungary. Yeah. Why? <laughs> you know, I don't really know where the pieces are being performed. I, I sort of know what sales and that kind of thing, but but it's always just an amazing thing to have have the music go out in front of you, you know, and then for people to really know it. Also, almost every person I've met in the festival or at the school has there's just so many singers here. I didn't realize Hungary had so many singers, I guess because of Kodai. Um, and, and so everyone that's come up to me has said very specifically, here's the piece that I sang of yours, or here are the pieces that I sang, they knew them by name, they remembered them. It, it's very humbling, but very surprising also. You know, here in Hungary we are very proud of our music culture because we had and have uh, great musicians uh, from Liszt, uh, from the 19th century, through Bartók and Kodai, um, to Lydia Kim and Kurtak. Uh, um, what kind of encounters did you have with uh, Hungarian music culture before? One of my favorite composers of all time is Bartok. And so, so I knew Bartok's music well. I know Ligeti's music pretty well. Um, I knew some Kodai, uh, but only, only the stuff that children do. I didn't really know the folk music so much. Um, and then Liszt, of course. I, I, I mostly know about Liszt that he was really the first rock star. Um, I know his music some, but but I'm, I think more I know the fame of, of this this bigger than life person. Uh, then, as a teacher, I mean uh, me, I start a music history lesson. I like to ask the musicians the definition of music. What is music, and what are the ingredients of music? So I'm very curious uh, what would be your answer for this question. What is <laughs> for music? You, what is music? You know, it's funny because you're a musician, right? so it, I'm a musician too. It's like trying to explain to somebody what is oxygen, right? <laughs> I can't, I, I can't even imagine a life without it. It's like, what is it like to take a breath? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, of course, I could break it down to rhythm and melody and harmony and these things and architecture and structure and time. Really, for me, it's um, uh, it's the purest way to communicate an emotion to another person. That's, at least in my experience, that's that's what music is. What about contemporary music? Because uh, here in Hungary, if uh, somebody listened, he hear this uh, word, this expression, contemporary music, uh, as I see, they feel uh, a clamp in their stomach. <laughs> because if it's something is contemporary, that means it's experimental and maybe somebody We'll do it something uh, on the piano with a hammer or an axe, yeah. or I don't know. What do you think about this whole phenomenon? In general, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> Most contemporary music is really hard to listen to. And it's not because the audience is uneducated. It's not with an education. I have a master's degree in composition, and still for me, most of it is difficult to listen to. And it's not going to get better. Um, some new contemporary music is not so difficult to listen to, or might be... It, it doesn't have to be beautiful or easy to listen to, but it has to acknowledge the audience and, and bring them along on the journey. I, my hope is that, that um, concerts will be programmed more like, like a, a dinner, right? So a great dinner party. 
you, you wouldn't want to serve a dish that no one has ever tasted before and it's really difficult to eat for every meal, right? <laughs> Maybe one of the meals, but then the rest of them can be things that will complement and things they're familiar with, and things that are a little appetit or a um, amuse bouche in between. Anyway, so so I think I think there's a place for it, but it's um, sometimes I think the classical music, contemporary classical music world wants to really force it on people. And I don't think that's the best approach. Hmm. Uh, let's talk about your dualism and the dualism of your musical background because you started as a mm, fan of pop rock uh, music yeah. and, uh, and later you you had the encounter with Mozart's Requiem <laughs> and, and the classical music and uh, here in Hungary, if you literally want to translate the word classical music, you used serious music, this expression. And if you want to talk about the other genres, the pop rock and so on, you use the category easy music. Everything is easy. And I try to avoid this serious music expression because we use the classical music as well. But what is your opinion about it and, uh, and in your life, how your both sides uh, inspire each other? Pop rock and the classic. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> the names. It's it's really interesting. The, the names I agree with. They're terrible. It's so serious music, right? Because then that implies that everything is like this. That the music yes. is is all mental and thoughtful and actually not emotional. And also that pop and rock music being called easy music. I I know some pop music that is as profound as any classical work ever written. It's as deep and says as much about the human condition as these other classical. Uh, formal works. So uh, I think a good a healthy balance of both is good. For me, um, I draw on, on both sides equally, I think. I think there's lessons to be learned in all of them. One of the things that I love about pop music that you don't always find in classical music is efficiency. That, that pop music has to do what it does in a very short amount of time. It has to, every moment has to be perfect. And that's a great lesson for a classical composer that every note counts and say as much as possible with as few notes as possible. And we usually complain about the members of the generation Y and Z that they don't like classical music and we are worrying about the future of uh, classical music and uh, what could we do in order to uh, bring the younger generations into the concert halls? Uh, hmm. Well, first, and Hungary knows this best, it's all about education when they're young, right? So they don't have to be musicians, they just have to have exposure to it. Mm -hmm. So the more exposure they have, the more this becomes an important part of their life growing older. Also, many of these people will go into administration or politics, and they'll start deciding whether or not music education is important. And if they have no experience with classical music, then of course they don't think it's important. And it's very easy for them to cut into the programs. So I think early on it has to happen. I think in general there is in classical music now, it's so stuffy. It makes me crazy, actually. So, it, for instance, even the, the concert that I did with my singers here two nights ago at the List Academy, they wanted to know the exact program, every piece and the order we would sing them a year in advance. One year ago, I had to tell them the exact program. But the world changes. And not only does the world change, but the energy in the room changes. So, if I go to a rock or a pop concert, it's They'll, they'll feel the audience and they'll know that, okay, the next song needs to be this. They'll change the whole set, do this, or let's make this, this extend this. You actually feel the energy in the room and it's, it's a much more immediate experience. For me, the dream would be that with my singers, we have 50 pieces on our iPads and then you just feel what the audience is feeling. Okay, let's do this. This is where we go. And let's do this. And now we do this and, and play a little bit more with it. Um, also, there's this terrible thing that we do in classical music where you sit as silently as possible, almost like church, and then at the end, then you clap. Even the end of three movements, you know, you clap, you between the movements, and then at the end you clap. It, 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 if the audience is moved to applaud or cheer or boo, then I think they should be able to. I think it'll, it'll bring you back to life. 
and in the beginning of the 20th century there were you know, scandals. Yeah, so that was exactly. the concept of Schoenberg and Stalinsky. <laughs> yeah, they caused scandals, exactly. Can you imagine that happening now? <laughs> no, no. And, and I feel that, for instance, some contemporary music, some of the music that we talked about that is so difficult to listen to, would really benefit from people standing up and just yelling, this is terrible, stop it, stop this madness. Maybe other people wouldn't agree, and maybe the piece isn't bad, but the dialogue needs to happen. There needs to be a sense that the piece is important and alive. It really feels like, like going to church now, where you sit, and this is happening all in front of you, and you just accept it. Yeah. At the end of this short interview, let's talk about uh, your compositional style. And uh, I ask this because you, you usually or always talk about the emotional structure, emotional architecture of That's music. Uh, how do you compose exactly? And what about this emotional structure if you compose a piece, uh, an instrument a piece? Ah, uh, yeah, a piece for orchestra, where you don't have a phone number of an ex girl, right? <laughs> so actually, it's it's more important for me to build the emotional architecture for an instrumental piece that doesn't have words than when I'm working with a choral piece. When when I have the poem, the structure in a way is already there. I can read the poem for the first time and see, oh, there's the basic musical structure of this. The poetry is dictating all of that. With an instrumental piece, you have to build the world from from scratch. So you have to really decide decide what is the journey the emotional journey that, that this piece will take. And then for me, I take a piece of paper and I, I paint or I draw the shape, the emotional shape of the piece before I even write a note. This is something that I learned from uh, John Corleano, the man that I studied with at Juilliard. Uh, he didn't call it emotional architecture. For him, it was just what is the shape of the piece. For me now, it's the emotional journey. That's how I think about it. This can echo here, and then this will be referenced here. And then, so the piece starts to have an emotional coherence and a real structure, and then I start to, to paint the harmonies and the melodies around it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, if I listen to your choral compositions, I feel that even your uh, dissonances are quite consonant. <laughs> uh, as, as I know, uh, you, you use the overtones and the overtone system. For me, ultimately, it's the, the only question when I'm writing. I never think. In, in theoretical terms. I never think, oh, this needs a, a flat seven or this needs a... Bit. And I don't really think in terms of the overtone series, although I have a, a I think maybe an intuitive sense for it. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's always emotional. So those dissonances that I love so much really are just about emotional color and subtle, trying to find subtle emotional colors. So it's not just uh, sad, but maybe it's melancholy with a hint of hope in it. And then one thing that, that writing for choir has taught me is real voice leading. So, so I spend a lot of time crafting lines that, that all feel like their own organic line, but then find their way into the cluster and then back out and into the cluster. So that there's a... Um, there, Fluctuation. Yeah, also, but that it's a graceful way into the... Into the so that then the dissonances aren't really like this. Yeah, exactly. They're more just, they come and then they go. And, they, and they're always the dissonances for you. They're never just to make a little color or a sound. They're always in service of the emotional truth of the piece. But in your lecture, uh, you you show a draft uh, about uh, composition, and, and you talked about the Fibonacci number as well. Yeah. So, what kind of other uh, inspirations do you have? Because uh, you are quite inspired by the cosmic things and astrophysics as well. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, although I have to say that actually the idea of using the Fibonacci sequence, I learned about it when I was younger, but the idea of using it in music was because of Bartok. Mm -hmm. You know, he used it at the beginning of the music for strings, celeste, and percussion. And so since then, the Fibonacci sequence especially, I've just become obsessed with. And I, I use it mostly to find the golden mean of the piece and then have the most important part of the piece based in that moment and then build to it and come away from it by using that Fibonacci sequence. And then in the, the small levels and then in the bigger levels. Mm -hmm. I don't think the audience can hear these things. I don't think the audience ever sits and listens and says, ah, there's the golden mean. <laughs> but I think they feel it, and I think there's something about the, the fact that it's the Fibonacci sequence, for instance. It's, it's a natural law of our universe, and I think we feel it. We, we can listen to it, and the music just feels right. We're not entirely sure why it feels right. It just does.
Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> <It> was painless. <laughs> You're great.